Sponsors, uh, St. Mary's University, USAA, Trend Micro, Digital Defense, and SANS. We wouldn't have this happen today if they weren't here, so make sure to stop by and thank your sponsors, okay? So I'd like to welcome Lindsay to the stand and give your full attention. All right, is this going through to the camera? I can also just yell. <laughs> Hello. Sorry, what? Oh. All right, I'm going to. All right, cool. I'm going to go ahead with uh, a little bit of an introduction. So this is Game Theory for Hackers. We'll be, uh, we'll be going over. Going over game theoretic models and how they can be applied to cybersecurity. And I'm Lindsay Von Tisch. Um, some people also know me as Juno. I respond to "Hey, you, whatever." <laughs> A little. So uh, first and foremost, who here is it your first time at besides uh, San Antonio? Oh, cool. That's 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 pretty much everyone. This is my first time at besides San Antonio, San Antonio, and actually my first time in San Antonio as well. Um, thank you. <laughs> Did yes. you take the mic? Yes. Right. Okay, awesome. Okay, yeah, for sure. All right, so a little bit about me. I'm a recent, co recent college grad actually from Anchorage, Alaska. And in college, I studied computer science and economics and got really, really excited about cybersecurity when I did my first CTF. Um, out outside, I also breathe fire and I'm in a band. I'm pretty much doing what, you know, age 17-year-old Lindsay would want me to do. Hacking things, playing in a band, breathing fire. But anyways, in, uh, in August, I moved to Dallas to be a data analyst for a, a corporation down there. And I've gotten really, really involved with the local InfoSec groups. Uh, who here is from Dallas Hackers Association? Yeah. yeah. I actually first gave this talk at Dallas Hackers Association. It was a 10-minute presentation on the prisoner's dilemma where I gave out free beer to the people who could best screw over their friends. It was lovely. Um, so what is game theory? Game theory is sort of the interdisciplinary marriage of statistics and behavioral economics. The cool thing about it is it's been used throughout history to model war and conflict, both historic and modern. There was a game theorist on staff during the Cold War, actually multiple. There are game theorists on staff uh, at NFL teams. And I believe in, I believe even one who models uh, who who models uh, soccer, and so it's to model the choices and decisions made by rational actors during times of conflict and competition. And I know what you're thinking: Where are we going to find rational actors? Definitely not in this room. But um, so I'm not giving out free beer this time. But um, a little bit of a roadmap: We're going to go through the Prisoner's Dilemma game, and I will be taking volunteers up to do to do things. You have been warned. If you are in here, I may I may yank you up. Um, and so we'll go through a couple different iterations of the prisoner's dilemma just to demonstrate that. Next, we'll go into the signaling game, which is just to demonstrate and model how false information can change outcomes. And then into my only computer-based game, a network detection game. So the prisoner's dilemma is probably one of the most popular game theory games. You can see it in TV. Um, popular psychology, movies, definitely cop shows. So I think everyone knows what it is, but just in case, two individuals are c arrested after committing a crime. However, there's no evidence, so they're separated, and they're both offered the same plea deal. If you rat out your co-conspirator, they'll take the fall for everything, you'll walk out scot-free, and everything will just go away for you. However, this offer has been offered to both individuals, but only one of them can accept it. If they both confess a choice that we'll call defecting on their partner, they will both go to prison. However, if they both manage to cooperate without communicating and confuse to confess, they'll, bo confess they'll both receive a little bit of a slap on the wrist, 
and go their own way. Now, I think the best way to demonstrate human-led games is with people. So I need two people to come up here for a second. All right, someone whispered all day. Oh, cool, guy in the back. Um, someone else just run up here. And I, I, will be doing, I will be doing more demos. So I'm going to hand, hold on, I'm gonna set this down for a sec. So I'm going to hand each of you a super fancy um, hotel uh, post-it note. I want you guys to face away from each other. There's, there's no communication. You guys are not friends. I have, <laughs> you guys are not friends. Not anymore, at least. I have imprisoned you and I've given you guys, oh no. I have given, I have given you guys this choice, I'd like you to write down this, uh, the choice on your post-it no note just without thinking about it. Go. <laughs> oh, hey, I can walk around with this. Awesome. Um, all right, so real fast, can you tell Tell us what you chose and why. I chose no. Well, I decided to trust her, and hopefully uh, it'll pay off. Hopefully my trust will pay off. All right, uh, same thing. Um, I just said it wasn't us. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right, so they, bo uh, they, they both managed to stay silent. Oh, you guys are free to go for now. Yeah, they both managed to stay silent. silent. Is that the right decision and is that the rational decision and is there a difference? So I have a, a simplified payoff matrix here. We have Alice and Bob who have committed a crime and gotten caught and been offered the prisoner's, di prisoner's dilemma deal. They both have the choice to cooperate with each other and stay silent or to defect and rat the other individual out. And now the thing to keep in mind is the higher payoff is better for the individual actor. So the highest payoff on this matrix is two, the choice to defect if the other player cooperates. And the lowest payoff is that negative one that you get if you cooperate while the other player defects. Now, because Alice and Bob cannot communicate, they have no way of knowing what the other individual will choose. So they have to base their decision solely off of what they think the other person might do. So if Alice believes that Bob will choose to cooperate, she'll choose to defect for that higher payoff. Similarly, if she believes Bob will choose to defect, she will defect as well for that higher payoff. Bob will make the same choices, defecting if he believes Alice will choose to cooperate and defecting if Alice will choose to defect. So this lands us in defect, defect. And this is what we call the Nash equilibrium. This is the logical outcome of the game. Now, as, as we've seen, this is, not, this is not always the outcome when people play because we, uh, with cooperate, cooperate, we have an option that is better for both players without any, making anyone in the game worse off. And this is called the Pareto optimal outcome. Now, one thing to keep in mind is this game is not always played in a vacuum. When I did this at Dallas Hackers Association, a lot of, uh, a lot of the people told me, hey, well, we're Dallas Hackers Association. Of course, we're friends. We're not, we're not going to rat each other out. And that mathematical model I just showed you does not take account anything except the, the potential payoff of going to prison. A repeated game is when our two, our two conspirators, Alice and Bob, go out, commit a crime, get caught, make a choice, and then they go out and do the same thing again. They get in the same situation where they have to make that choice again and again. And again, and you would think at some time, point they would give up the life of crime or at least learn not to get caught, but here we are. So I'd like to bring up two more people to do this a couple of times. All right, I see you in the red shirt. What's your name? Roman, that's an awesome name. Also, I love your shirt. All right, who wants to send this poor kid to jail? All right. I like how only did someone's hand go up after that. <laughs> oh, uh, I believe the two pens are right there. All right, so face away from each other. Don't don't look at Roman. Don't don't show any mercy for him. And uh, I'd like you to write your first decision down. Yes. <laughs> 
And then, I'm, uh, again, I'm going to ask you to explain your choice. All right, are you ready? Cool. All right. You can face them. Well, I chose to cooperate. I chose to defect. <laughs> All right, why did you... I'm going to jail. Uh, well, I mean, obviously, uh, we've, we've been committing crimes together this whole time, and it's been working out. <laughs> so I figured my little buddy would uh, want to do the same thing. All right, can you pass him the... So why do you defect? I just, I just wanted to see what would happen, and and I thought, and I thought, I, I just, I would do it, so I chose to do fat. I think what happens is I go to jail. Yeah, so he goes to jail now, but there's more. Wait, 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 stay here. Now, knowing, knowing what the decision your opponent made, I'd like you guys to do it again. Ooh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is definitely going to be the most interesting one I've ever done. All right, I'm going to go to you for uh, I'm going to go to you first this time. What do you choose to do? Defect. <laughs> and why? What? Why? Because since because since I defected him the last round, I I don't think he would trust me this round. We get into that later. This guy's gonna be a game theory expert. All right, what about you? <laughs> I cooperated. All right, so just, just to rub it in a little bit more, I'd like you guys to do it one more time. He's going down. <laughs> All right, I don't have an extra piece of paper, so just write your choice on that piece of paper. And that's just to hold you accountable so that when he defects on you again, you can't just change your answer. <laughs> All right, what do you choose to do? Defect. <laughs> Why? And same thing last round, because it happened twice. Nice. All right, what about you? I definitely defected. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, you guys. <laughs> All right, so now I know who to commit crimes with and who not to commit crimes with. Which really, that's, exa that's, that's what game theory is about. All right, so... We're going to go into the uh, the repeat. Oh, this, these are the rules again. So with this exact same payoff matrix. So we're going to go into the repeated game now. Roman mentioned that the reason he continued to defect was he believed that his opponent would decide to start defecting, and that's what we call a punishment strategy. A punishment strategy is used to essentially motivate the other player to cooperate with you. And now there are multiple types of punishment strategies, but I believe the most realistic, and I believe it was shown here, is the grim trigger punishment strategy, which is very, very simple. You're going to cooperate until betrayed, and then you're going to defect every single time afterwards. Now, this does leave you open to betrayal in the beginning once, but there's a, uh, there's a huge amount of room for retribution afterwards. One thing we need to keep in mind, however, is the discount, ma uh, the discount factor, which is essentially a measure of patience. Because the f payoff in the future is worth just uh, is worth at least a little bit less than payoff uh, that you can get right now, and the discount factor is just d, a number between zero and one that represents that decrease in payoff. So, if you're playing against an opponent who you think will be using the grim trigger punishment strategy, you know that as long as you cooperate with them, your opponent will cooperate with you. So the payoff to cooperate is going to be one minus the discount factor multiplied by one, the payoff you'll get for cooperating with them, multiplied by one, the best possible payoff um, if when they cooperate in the, or the, sorry, the payoff you'll get when they cooperate in the future multiplied by the discount factor out on into the future. And that will simplify down to one. The payoff to defect is one minus the discount factor multiplied by two, the payoff you'll get for defecting when they cooperate plus zero, the best possible payoff when they defect on you later in the future, on out into the future. 
and that will simplify down to 2 multiplied by 1 minus d. And when you set those equal to each other, you get d is equal to 1 half. This means for the payoff of cooperation to be greater than the payoff of defecting, the discount factor or the discount factor has to be greater than one half. Future payoff must be worth at least more than one half the present payoff. Now, once you do betray your opponent, and this is the logic our friend was going for, you know that they're going to defect every single time afterwards. So the payoff to cooperate. Is, go uh, is going to be equal to the discount factor minus 1. The payoff to defect will always be equal to 0 because your opponent will continue defecting out into the future. When you set, the, uh, when you set those equal to each other, you get a discount factor of 1. So for the payoff of, to cooperate to be greater than the payoff to defect, the discount factor has to be greater than 1, which means the future payoff has to be worth more than present payoff, which is not possible. So once you have defected, it is always better to continue to defect. Now, uh, so, so that's, uh, that's a more human-based scenario. We're going to move into a simple attack defense scenario that takes a bit more of a cybersecurity angle, although this scenario is very, very simple. You have a game between an attacker and a defender. The attacker can choose to attack or pass, and the defender can choose to monitor their systems or not monitor their systems. If there's a cost for the defender to monitor their system, and there's a cost for the attacker to attack a system that has been monitored. So if we try and find the logical outcome of the game, we know that for the attacker, if they believe the defender won't monitor or will monitor their system, they will choose to pass, and if they believe that they won't monitor their system, they'll choose to attack. Similarly, if the defender believes the attacker will attack, they'll choose to monitor, but if they believe the defender will not attack, they'll choose to not monitor. Now, in this scenario, we don't have a Nash equilibrium. We don't have, a, uh, we don't have an end where the choices line up. So what does this end up meaning? So let's, uh, what this means is the likelihood that, the, the, that one of the players will do something can force the player to do something else. So let's let P equal the likelihood that the defender will monitor their systems. The expected value of attacking is equal to the probability that that system is monitored multiplied by the payoff of attacking a monitored system plus the probability that the system is not monitored multiplied by the payoff of attacking a non-monitored system. The expected value of passing will always be equal to zero. When you set those, when you set those equal to each other, you get a P of one half, which means with, it's a 50-50 probability a system is defended, the attacker is indifferent about attacking. So if there's a way, so the, the previous games we've seen have been simultaneous games where the players cannot communicate with each other, except for in case of the repeated game, the decisions they've made in the past. However, as soon as we add communication between players, we also add the element for mistruth and falsehood. So the signaling game shows what happens when one player can misrepresent their capabilities or intentions. So we have a signaling game, and this will be again between the attacker, attackers and defenders. And defenders are going to be either high quality defenders who have the capability to monitor their system and low quality defenders who do not. And a defender can signal that they're a high quality defender and that their systems are secure at a cost. And this cost is higher to low quality defenders than it is to high quality defenders. And the attacker does not know which capabilities the defender has. All the attacker can see is whether or not a signal has been given, which makes it a game with incomplete information. So here we have our decision tree. The first, the first move in the center is just a move by nature, and that determines with probability of third that the, that the defender is either high quality or low quality. Next, moving out is the choice of the defender to either signal or not, and signaling comes at a cost. Finally, at the end, is, is the choice by the attacker to attack or pass. And you see the line between two of, uh, t between two of the sets of nodes, that's because the attacker only knows whether they've seen a signal or not. They don't know the capabilities of the defender, so the attacker does not know which of those nodes they're on. So let's start with a separating equilibrium, where high-quality defenders will signal and low-quality defenders will not signal. 
This leads to a simple solution for the attackers. They will, if there's a signal, they will pass. If there's no signal, they will attack. However, this does not work out for the low quality defenders who are getting that payoff of negative 10. If you can see it on this side, for, for getting attacked every single time. So if they start signaling, if all defenders signal, high quality, uh, or if high quality and low quality defenders signal, attackers will attack a certain percentage of the time based off of the probability that the defender giving the signal is high quality or low quality. And in this case, high quality defenders are signaling a third of the time and low quality defenders are signaling two thirds of the time. So if attackers attack X percent of the time, uh, uh, we're the, now the payoff to a high, the payoff of attacking a high quality defender is negative 10 and the payoff of attacking a low quality defender is 10. So the expected value of attacking, given that they've seen a signal, is going to be equal to the probability that the signal came from a high quality defender multiplied by the payoff of attacking a high quality defender. And that pi there is payoff. Um, I realized I didn't make that clear earlier plus the probability the signal came from a low quality defender multiplied by the payoff of attacking a low quality defender, which is going to be equal to three and a third. The expected value of passing is always zero. So in this scenario, the expected value of attacking is always greater than the expected value of passing, meaning attackers will attack 100% of the time. So if we go back to the decision tree, we'll find that this is even worse for the low quality defenders because not only are they getting that, that negative payoff from being attacked, they're also having to pay the cost of signaling. So some of them will stop signaling. And this leads us to our semi-separating equilibrium, which is the only true equilibrium of the game. High quality defenders will signal and low quality defenders will signal X percent of the time. Attackers will attack a signal Y percent of the time, and if there's no signal, they'll attack 100 percent of the time. And below is just the probability that the signal came from a high quality or low quality defender, which is relevant later, but I used Mathematica to solve it for me. <laughs> so if Y is the probability the attacker will attack a defender, we actually want to look at the expected value to the low quality defender of giving a signal. So y, or we multiply y, the probability that they will be attacked by the payoff of sending a signal and getting attacked, plus 1 minus y, the payoff, or the, sorry, the probability that they will not get attacked, plus, or multiplied by the payoff of sending a signal and getting passed over. We compare that to the expected value of not sending a signal which is always getting attacked, so that's always negative 10. When we set those equal to each other, we get y is equal to 17 twentieths. This means attackers will attack if they see a signal 17 times out of 20. Now we need to find x, the probability that a defender without the tech to monitor their system will signal that they can. The expected value of attacking is going to be equal to the probability it's uh, it's a high quality defender sending a signal multiplied by the payoff of attacking a high quality defender plus the probability it's a low quality defender sending the signal multiplied by the payoff of attacking a low quality defender. The expected value of passing will always be equal to zero. So if we set that equal and solve for x, we'll get one quarter, which means a quarter of low quality defenders will signal that they can monitor their systems. So this is how the game ends up looking this is, how, this is how it ends up evening out in a scenario like this. High quality defenders will signal and low quality defenders will signal a quarter of the time. If an attacker sees a signal, they'll attack 17 times out of 20. And if no signal is seen, they will, they will attack every single time. Now, the interesting thing about human-based games is it often feels like there are an infinite amount of choices, which is why I believe that the true interdisciplinary power of game theory actually is shown in computer versus computer games. So this is a simplified attack simulation, or this is a simplified simulation between a server and nodes. We've got two types of nodes, user nodes who want, just want to send along the data and malicious nodes that want to corrupt the data. And 
the server wants to watch for malicious traffic, but doesn't want to watch every single node because then service will suffer. So the game for the server is pretty simple. After the server connects with a node and receives a packet, it can do one of three things. Nothing, which is the safest. Nothing happens, no one wins. Send along the packet, which is good if the node is a user, bad if the node is malicious. And watch the node, which is bad if the node is a user, and good if the node is malicious. Similarly for the nodes, they can do nothing, nothing happens, no one wins, everything is safe. Send along the packet, or corrupt the packet. So first, if we look at the game between a user node and a server node, the first thing we notice is that choosing to corrupt the packet is the opposite of what a user node would do. A user node would not corrupt a packet. Therefore, the choice to corrupt is strictly dominated by the options to do nothing and send, because that's either uh, in either option, no matter what the server does, it's always better to do nothing or send for the user node than corrupt a packet. So we can remove this from our payoff matrix. If we look at the game between the server and the malicious node, we have a similar set off with different payoffs for the node. Now, uh, now, like the, now, like the user node, the option to send for the malicious node is strictly dominated by the option to do nothing. No matter what the server does, do nothing, send, or watch the packet, the malicious node would prefer to do nothing than send the packet on. So we can remove this from our payoff matrix. And when that's removed, the option to send along the packet is strictly dominated by the option to do nothing for the server. So we can remove this. This brings us to a much more simplified game between the server and the malicious node. Now, what does this end up meaning? User nodes will always choose to send along a packet or do nothing with it. And malicious nodes will always choose to do nothing or corrupt the packet. So, what, in this scenario, what does a repeated game between the malicious node and the server look like? So here, we're returning to the repeated game idea that we brought up in the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, the server can do nothing or watch the packet, and the malicious node can do nothing or corrupt the packet. Now, in this scenario, like before, we'll have the server use a grim trigger punishment strategy. The server can do nothing or will do will choose to do nothing unless the node has corrupted a packet. However, if the node corrupts a packet, it will be watched for every single inner iteration afterwards. So as long as the malicious node has not corrupted a packet, the server will choose to do nothing. So for the malicious node, the payoff to do nothing is going to be equal to one minus that discount factor multiplied by the payoff of doing nothing multiply uh, by with the discount factor on out into the future which will end up being equal to 0.5 the payoff to corrupt will will end up being uh, will end up being equal to 1 minus the discount factor oh there's a typo in my slide oh well so but for <laughs> for doing nothing to have a higher payoff than corrupting the packet the future payoff must be worth more than half of the current payoff so this discount factor this depends on the patient of whoever set this system up. Now, once the malicious node does corrupt a packet, the server will watch it for every single inter inter interaction afterwards. The payoff of doing nothing will be equal to zero, and the payoff of corrupting will be equal to negative three multiplied by one minus that discount factor. And this, uh, when you set these equal to each other, the payoff of doing nothing will always be greater than the payoff to corrupt. So, once the node has corrupted a packet, it's better to just continue along doing nothing. So where do we go from here? What do we do with this information? This is not the end all be all guide to game theory. This is just a taste of it. I want everyone here to leave wondering how they can apply game theory, to, uh, how they can, wondering how they can apply game theory to the things they do in their job, in their life, secretly in their sketchy home lab made of raspberry pies. <laughs> And there, uh, now there are a lot of limitations in game theory. I think, in, especially in my watered-down scenarios, I think the biggest limitation is realism. For example, going back to the signaling game, how exactly does a defender signal that they're a high-quality defender, especially creditably? As we know, if a company were to say, hey, we're unhackable, well, actually, as we've seen, 
They're going to go down in about five hours, and we'll be able to watch the whole thing play out on Twitter. So, uh, so adding that realism in is hard. I actually have another version of that game where I've added in two types of defender or, or two types of attackers, into uh, script kitties who are who are deterred by the signal and the idea of of, of attacking a high quality defender, and more brave attackers who see that signal and get a really high payoff from attacking a defender that is lied and signal that they're high quality when they're not. But that gets more and more complex and has 16 payouts. I think another place I'd like to go with this is modeling CTF. Um, who here knows Tinker? <laughs> Tinker once said that he does not like CTFs because it's not hacking, it's a model of another person's brain. And I think it would be incredibly exciting to start applying applying game theory to CTFs and think about to think about how the person set it up would have set it up. Would they, if there are seven equally uh, equally equal equal options that could get you a flag, which one is the most likely based on what you've seen through, throughout the rest of the CTF? So the takeaway here is that I want you to think about how these models can be applied. One of the other, uh, there are of course limitations, um, as I, there are the ones I mentioned earlier, there's also the limitations of determining those payoffs and motivation. The payoffs I used in my example, I used because they made the math easier. There's also a question of complexity. As these games get more and more complex, they get larger and larger, not only leaving room for error, but rumor for mis or leaving room for misinterpretation. But game theory has been used to model, to model warfare, to model sports, to model football even. I think the next step is to start applying it to cybersecurity. Um, my contact information is below as well as some of my sources. Um, I'd like to use some of this time to, for anyone with questions, comments, snide remarks, let me know. Yes. Uh, so I have, have a, just a couple of thoughts. Uh, as you were talking about it, about signaling in particular, um, I, I think uh, having focused a lot of time this year on the defender side of fishing, um, you know, well, most of the time we're giving the fishers an absence of a signal, and um, by simply believing the fish. They don't get any feedback. They don't know whether it was rocket. They don't know whether the end user did anything with it. It was blocked by an anti spam, anti malware system, or something like that. And I wonder, uh, just you know, should we at, at applying this game theory to cybersecurity? Should we send a signal back, like through the SMTP logs, and like go away? Right? And that, that would be a signal we could send back, as opposed to nothing, which maybe makes us look like you know the less sophisticated. So um, I'm going to repeat your question back for the video. The question is, in times, in cases of phishing, if you don't really send a signal, you just right, report it. Should we start sending sending a signal back? And I hate to say this, but that depends on your opponent. Because if you send a signal back, they might know that they've been caught. They might give up. They also might try harder. So that's what uh, I think that would be a very fun question to model to see do they get deterred do they try harder what what are the responses of those attackers Any other questions All right well um you'll know how you'll know where to find me I'll be wandering around um in a blazer Thank you so much everyone for coming Thank you everyone again who participated as well. That was that was definitely the most fun demo I've I've done. <laughs> uh, yes, thank you so much. I'm Juno. Please hit me up with any questions later. Yeah, thank you.